Hi, hello, I'm Dahlia. This is where we live and help live, kind of like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, except for adults. And I don't wear sweaters. I wear hoodies. So this is the first episode of Dahlia. You are one of the first people to stop by my quiet little house warming. Welcome to the neighborhood. How the help are you? I know I'm super excited because I'm telling you right now, you and I will make good things happen. This podcast has been a decade in the making. And so I thought, What better way to introduce myself to you than by sharing my biggest, best failures with you. So zip up, buttercup, get that sweater on, because here we go. Her hair is curly, her teeth are pearly. She's got an edge, but she's still pretty girly. Oh, oh. Nothing rhymes with Dahlia. Do you know what you want to do with your life? A tough question, right out of the gate, right? So why do we expect kids to know? Seriously, every time an adult goes up to a six-year-old and says, Oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I, I, I don't know what to say. What do you want to be? One thing? We're relegating this kid with all these years ahead. To one thing? I don't know. Maybe, how about, are you making a list of all of the things you want to be when you grow up? Tell me how that list is going. And we use this question. We adapt it as we get older, right? What do you do? This is one of the first questions we ask someone. What do you do? As if this determines who someone is. In this crazy world, that is the furthest way from getting to know someone else. People are still trying to get to know themselves. In fact, people are getting further and further away from who they are as they get older. And we ask this question, And look at all of these kids who are pressured into choosing a path for their future, whether about to graduate or years from graduating or just graduated. Or maybe this is you in your 20th year at some job you hate. And do you even know what you want to do now? Graduation is a ridiculous thing, really. What have you graduated to? Another level of anxiety? So this got me thinking. I've graduated, I don't know, three times. If talking about anxiety, I've graduated many more times than that. And I've never really gone to grad. I went to my kindergarten grad, but I'm not counting that because that set the bar way too high, especially with the super cute picture I drew. But I mean like those milestones. I mean high school, university. And then when I went back to school again for journalism, when I said, no, I'm never going back to school again, I might as well just throw in, no, I'm never going to win the lottery right now because maybe I actually will. But I get asked by my old high school, right? Because I'm thinking of graduation and this brings me back to this time that my old high school asks me to give a speech to its honor students. They tell me these are the best of our best students and I'm thinking, well, the best of your best students aren't necessarily your honor students, but I Dahlia Gresp. I mean, I, I barely even attended high school. I finished high school when I was about 15 years old And it's not that I was super brilliant or anything. I was just in a super rush to get out of there. I just, I just wanted to get out of school. And now I'm supposed to inspire kids about school? What, what type of speech can I give to them? And I decide, okay, this is what I need to do. I need to talk to these kids about my biggest failures because we talk way too much about successes. And don't get me wrong here because, look, this is an honor to be sure when I'm asked to speak to these students at my old high school. But I I sort of wondered, are these people inviting me because they think I have some sort of level of success that could set somewhat of a good example or perhaps inspire these kids? But these kids, they've succeeded at graduating high school. They've succeeded at being, hey, the best of the best in sports, the best of the best in academics. Do they need me to teach them about success? 
they need me to teach them about failure. That, that I can do. So that's what I did. In fact, I chose to share two of my biggest failures that significantly impacted my life, even though those two failures came from entirely different points in it. One from when I was eight years old and the other as an adult. I know, I know, don't worry. I have so many more failures I could tell you about. I could tell you about the countless times I've been rejected, whether it was as an actor for whatever role or whether it was rejections from guys when I was 15, the cool boy from school, the one with the green hair, Jesse, chose Charlene over me, or whether it was when I was 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Now you know I can count. And I don't want to show you how high I can count because I could take those numbers pretty high when I tell you about any number of the boys who chose another girl over me or whether it was the job I didn't get at a major network when I wouldn't straighten my hair to be on TV. Because really, who would take a woman with blonde curly hair seriously, right? Or whether it was Bye Bye Barbie. This is a program I created, a program I was so proud of, so passionate about. The country's first ever body image awareness program to help girls and boys and deconstruct these superficial ideals of beauty we subscribe to, to reconstruct what real beauty is to each person. And I let that fall by the wayside to follow a guy wherever he wanted to go. Now look, there's nothing wrong with following someone. As long as you continue to follow through with who you are. But I think I was just afraid I'd keep failing. And this way I could follow someone which would really allow me to hide behind him. I could hide my tries, hide what I really wanted, hide myself from failing, hide myself from me. So I failed at being me. Being me, being you, this is the hardest thing to do, right? It's always been hard. I'd look back at my high school days. I don't even know who that kid was. I dyed my hair black. I used the palest makeup to cover up my tan skin. I don't have pictures with my super green contacts in place where my hazel eyes are. But I think somehow you still get the picture, right? And look, I can list an endless amount of my failures. But again, these are not the failures I need to share with you. And before we get to those two life-changing failures, I actually, I had to almost die. So one sunny Sunday morning, I'm on my way to a gloomy gig, a job I just don't like, but I'm following this guy, so I'm doing everything for him and nothing for me. And I'm driving my compact car through a green light. A woman in an SUV decides, oh, I'm going to drive through a red light. Mm. I see her coming. And I remember my thought process so clearly, so clearly, that I thought this through as if it took minutes instead of these nanoseconds to process. My first thought, I'm going to avoid this. My second thought, oh my God, I can't avoid this. My third thought, I'm too young to die. And then I saw the bright white light that so many people talk about in these near-death experiences. And I'll tell you what that bright white light is. The airbag. Mm Mm-hmm. And that woman smashed into me, driver's side, pushing my car, I don't know, half a block, a fraction of a second difference, a fraction, and I'd be dead. Maybe if I didn't change the radio station five minutes before, maybe if I I didn't sneeze before I left the house. I don't even remember if I sneezed, but these are little things that you think now, this could have changed everything. Would I have been dead? I'm talking about my own death. This means I have an expiration date. I'm not invincible. I'm not invincible. And we all know. You know. But we don't realize it. I never realized that before. 
This woman literally pushed me off my course and figuratively pushed me onto another course. Because now, well, now my life had to have meaning. And I made a plan. And I planned to accomplish this quickly because you never know. So I'll go back to writing. I'll be a national columnist. Then I'll be a nationally syndicated columnist. And this all sounds impossible. And check, 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 done. I accomplish it. And it is not easy just because I say check, 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 done. But when you realize that you could be check, 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 done. Oh, wow. Boy, that certainly makes you work a whole lot harder. And then we get to this point where people start calling me to join on their radio shows. I'm a writer. And if so many people want me on their radio show, okay, well, why don't I have my own show? Now I want a radio show. So I contact this big name radio industry guy with my pretty terrible demo that I make. He takes like, I don't know, a week or so, finally gets back to me. I don't even think he's the one who called me. I called him. I'm sure I called him. And and he says to me, Dahlia, you are a star. No, he actually, he did not say that at all. He said, you'll never be hired as a talk show host. Try something else. This is not your world. Okay. So, naturally, a few days later, I apply to be a talk show host at one of the country's oldest and most respected radio stations because every don't is just an invitation to do. And I don't know, I think 10-year-old me made that up and I need to listen to her way more often and stop talking in third person. So that stops now. And so just like that, I gave up a good life that I'd worked so hard to establish in the big city. And then I start over in a small city and I leave everything and everyone I've come to know. I become a radio talk show host, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Sounds fearless, right? I was petrified. You see, I'm afraid of everything. I'm just not afraid to do anything. Kind of a weird juxtaposition, but hi, I'm Dahlia. So I was a nationally syndicated writer. I'd also done radio and TV before, but I'd never been a talk show host. And without any training, I'm given a radio icon's old time slot. Charles Adler, his time slot. No experience, no pressure, right? It's the first day of the show. It's also, oh, look at that, the first day of ratings. September 3rd, 2013, one o four p.m. And the red light on the mic turns on and the first words out of my mouth. Hi, I'm Charles Adler. And the rest of the show went downhill from there. I wanted to quit. I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. I'm not like the other hosts. And if I pretend to be, you'll know. Worse, I'll know. But wanting to quit. I want to quit. Well, I mean, okay. I also want chocolate cake. I want french fries. Not together. But now that I said that, I kind of want to see what they taste like together. But I dolly aggress. But... You want to quit. What does that mean? What do you really want in the future? Where do you want to go? You look to that. But in my panic, I had this weird moment of clarity. And I realized in that moment that the more authentic I am, the less I screw up. And the easier it'll be to own those many screw-ups that I promise you I continue to make and you could probably count them right through this entire conversation today. And by the by, when I say authentic, I don't mean it in that Instagram sort of way where you post a beautiful picture of yourself with some performative post on vulnerability. 
This, this performative authenticity that we seem to have redefined as authentic is the furthest thing from it, and it's really messing with people's minds. I mean authentic, as in getting your face dirty on that arena floor in front of all of these people, and you do it, and you don't feel comfortable, but you're comfortable in who you are. I mean authentic as in finding what is essential about you, what is essential to you that cannot be seen by the naked eye, that invisible essential part of you, that's what's authentic. So okay, I like to make good things happen, that's what's authentic to me. I'll create a show to help make good things happen. I just had no clue how to accomplish that. And I was on that arena floor. And I was messing up. And people laughed at the beginning. And social media ate me up. And this is the place where the knives come out. People spare no feelings but tweet hashtags like mental health matters at the same time as much as they can. And then the bosses, the bosses would not even market or promote my show, not on the station, not on social media. What an embarrassment. But you know what happened? The bosses didn't have to market my show. Because people, there are people who look for the helpers. There are people who look to be the helpers. This exists. So the people who are looking for a safe, positive, and kind space, and the people who are looking for the helpers and looking to be the helpers, they found it. It's a science. It's actually the science of kindness, and it's called swarming. It's real. I studied it. This isn't from the Dahlia National Research Institute of Dahlia Research. This is from a professor from a real la di da university. His name is Richard Yanda, and Richard has made it a big part of his life's work because kindness helps make life work. So really, my goal to make good things happen started accomplishing itself because of three things. I worked very hard. I stayed true to myself with all that dirt on my face despite what anyone said, and there was a lot that was said. And because of, and this is key, the power of connection. Your whole life, people will tell you about success. They're the keys to success, what you need to be successful. And if success is what drives you, okay, you'll push for that elusive perfection. And eventually, you too may want to share your success stories. But you know what? We hear far too much about other successes. We never ask about their failures. I have spent so much of my career asking people about their failures. Yet ironically, or appropriately, my talk show has always been seen as a positive one. Because you know what I've learned from other people's failures? I learned about all of these positive things there are that we never hear about. Resilience. I learned how people have used resilience in so many ways. And I also learned to constantly fail, to constantly fail in front of others, and not just a few people, but thousands of others as I did my show. And this leads me to my two biggest failures, and by default, my biggest successes. So at eight years old, (laughs) eight years old, God, the pressure we put on ourselves, eight years old, sadly, I already thought of myself as a failure. But a fortuitous moment on November 2nd, 2014, turned that failure into one of my greatest successes. So I just finished hosting this radiothon at a hospital. A man named Stu introduces himself to me. And when I was eight, he was a counselor at my camp. And that camp was run by a woman named Carol. And Stu told me Carol died almost exactly two years ago that day. So sad. She was so young. She was 52. 
and I'll never forget what Stu told me next. At the end of Carol's life, the two of them reminisced about fun times in life and the children Carol had tirelessly worked with. And that's when they started talking about me. Me. They remembered a night at camp when we were doing skits. I was in a skit, but it wasn't a speaking role. And as Stu gave the scenario, I remembered that performance and remembered how upset I was that I didn't have lines. I wouldn't be memorable. At eight years old, I was thinking, I'm not going to be memorable. I felt like a failure. So picture this. I played the part of eh, a boring grandma, and all I had to do was eat a stupid cookie throughout my scene. So, of course, I'm dressed as an old woman, and one of my accoutrements, or two of them, as it were, gave me ample bosom. And all I had to do was eat a cookie in the scene. And as I was eating that cookie, crumbs kept falling onto my chest. And Stu told me I spent the entire scene repeatedly taking a bite of the cookie, then brushing cookie crumbs off of my old lady bosom. Apparently, Carol and Stu laughed right through my performance. I stole the show and didn't know it. But what really gets to me, that snapshot from my life, that unmemorable moment in my life at eight years old made Carol laugh at the end of hers. And this moment that Stu shared with me on that November day will now be one that I will never forget either. It's just, I'll remember it for a different reason. The power of connection. So fast forward to my first talk show. I worked very hard. I was the content producer and host for the show. I received lovely messages from listeners, kind, gracious, thoughtful. I also received some terrible ones. And so I had to desensitize myself. If I'm not going to listen to the bad things people say about me, why am I going to listen to the good things people say about me? And besides, I was just, I was so caught up in the hustle. And I just felt, I felt unfulfilled. Was I really making this difference that I set out so strongly to make? Well, now I'm failing at the most meaningful thing in the world to me because I'm not feeling this, this special thing. I'm not seeing anything tangible unfold in front of my eyes. Then a couple of days after, I left that first host job because it was time to move on. So it's like two days after my last show, I received this email in the middle of the night from a man I don't remember ever meeting him in my life. And I'd like to share this with you. Dear Dahlia, I cannot sleep tonight. So I've decided to finally write you an email about you leaving your show. I'm not sure if you remember me or not, but it doesn't matter. To be honest, I haven't listened to your show in two weeks because I heard you're leaving. And I can't describe to you how much this hurts. This is for very selfish reasons. Dahlia, I haven't had many role models that have worked out for me in my life until I came across you. And I can't describe to you how much you've truly changed my life. I never expected to grow as much as I have by simply listening to a radio show host. I'm not dumb. I know you have days, tough days like everyone else, but how have you come to work every day and be so positive about life? It's so amazing to me. I just want to thank you for everything you've done for me. Three years ago, I did not want to live. And you have completely changed my life. I just need you to know how much of an impact you made on my life, and I'm sure many others. I wish you the best of luck, and just thank you again for being you. That email. Mm. <laughs> you never know whom you're touching or how you're touching them. You do it all the time. 
and just don't know it. You may not have a microphone in front of your face and people writing you emails with their faces hidden behind computer screens. But so many people live and help live. They don't have those microphones in front of their faces. You live and help live. You do. You really do. You see, my biggest failure has always really been just failing to recognize my true capabilities. And I still can't tell you what my true capabilities are. But you know what? You can't tell me what your true capabilities are either. Because you're always more capable than you think you are. And you may never know your greatest successes. I was fortunate to have discovered a couple of mine through Stu and that listener. But you'll always know your greatest failures, won't you? Please, don't beat yourself up over them. Build yourself up from them. And just know it's not your failures or even your successes that define you. Your values define you and how you apply them. And how you apply them can turn your worst moments into your best moments. But those greatest accomplishments, they'll never happen in the moments when you're alone. They'll only happen when you're connected. So if you live and let live, you live an isolated life. If you live and help live, you'll live an accomplished life. And you'll give so much to other people's lives. Probably many times without even trying. So let's you and I stay connected. Because we will make good things happen. I promise. So if you liked this episode, hey, go ahead and share it. I'm always thinking about you and already have some excellent episodes in store. Right now, you're actually in on the sneak preview of the show. And during this time, you can expect podcasts once a week, but not just podcasts. You'll also get weekly columns and videos. Once the official launch happens in September, you'll get two podcasts a week. I'll also introduce you to everyday people doing extraordinary things, plus my network of angels who always leave a trail of kindness. So... If you want these podcasts, videos, and articles directly in your inbox, just sign up at daliakurtz.com and say hi anywhere on social media at Dahlia Kurtz, D-A-H-L-I-A, Dahlia, yes, I know, my parents, I'm sure they put that H in there just to mess you up. Thanks for dropping by the neighbor, Alia. I'm Dahlia. Live and help live. Oh, oh, nothing rhymes with Dahlia, nothing rhymes with Dahlia, nothing rhymes with Dahlia.